Hello everyone. As you may well have gathered by now, I censor swear words on this podcast. However, for this episode, I've decided to leave them in because the overall effect of the content would be different without them. Hello and welcome to the Wormhole Podcast, episode 34. I'm Charlie Place, and joining me today is the author of Number One Chinese Restaurant, an incredibly unapologetically character-driven novel, which was long-listed for the Women's Prize for Fiction in 2019 and was an NPR Best Book of 2018. Hello, Lillian Lee. Hi, Charlie. Thanks so much for having me on. How are you? I'm great. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Very happy to have you on. It's going to be good. You work part-time at Literati in Ann Arbor. What is it like working in a bookshop as an author? Yeah, so actually, since the pandemic, I went on voluntary furlough, so I'm no longer working there. But before everything changed, it was, I think, one of the most grounding things that I was able to do, especially when my book was going into publication, in part because it was just a really daily reminder that I wasn't necessarily writing for other writers, the people that I had gone to graduate school with, the people who made up a lot of my friends. I was writing predominantly for readers and being able to talk to readers every day, recommend books to them, and just see how readers tend to read books in good faith with the assumption that the author knows what they're doing and is doing it well. That kind of you know hopeful and genuine but also generous kind of reading helped calm me a lot and it also just reminded me that that's who I always hope to be writing for. So is your to be read pile longer having talked to customers? Oh my god it's so long and I'm looking at my bookshelf right now and it is overflowing with advanced copies and damages from the shelf that I just had to take even though I knew there was no room left. I think that my reading list not only grew longer but broader as well and the kinds of titles that i was reading were ones that maybe i wouldn't have thought i would be interested in but i just became a lot more of a dabbler once i got to talk to the kinds of readers who come through my bookstore listeners number one chinese restaurant looks at the people behind the scenes at the beijing duck house which is run by the han brothers Johnny and Jimmy, whose father started the restaurant decades before. We see the lives and relationships of the front and back of house staff, their family conflicts and worries, the passage of time as they stay at the restaurant. If you'll pardon the pun, these issues have been simmering in the background and they come to the fore when tragedy strikes. Lillian, you have a reading from chapter three for us. That's right. The first thing Jimmy did once he'd barricaded himself in his tiny office was pour a glass of scotch. The second thing he did was call Uncle Pong's real estate agent, Janine. While he waited for the connection to go through, he stared at the photograph of his father hanging alongside the office door. The picture had been taken on the duck house's opening day. His father had been only a few years older than Jimmy was now. It was the same photo they sent to the Washington Post to accompany the obituary. The actual newspaper clipping was shoved somewhere in his desk drawer. Jimmy had refused to let Johnny frame that too, but the lie it told was so familiar that Jimmy had practically memorized it. Bobby Hong Chung Han, a prominent Maryland restaurateur and founder of the Beijing Duck House, passed peacefully on Independence Day, July 4th, 2010, surrounded by his family and friends. Mr. Han was born on February 2nd, 1940 in Beijing, China, and started his life in restaurants as a dishwasher at the age of 12. Mr. Han married Feng Fei, his next door neighbor and the love of his life, and immigrated to America on his own in 1975 to give his family a better life. Separated from his adored wife and children, Mr. Han worked his way through the restaurant ranks in Virginia, Maryland, and Washington, D.C. to buy their ticket to America. The Beijing Duck House, Mr. Han's crowning glory, opened its doors in 1985, the product of over a decade of hard work and determination. 
Mr. Han combined the strong flavors and rich seasonings of Northern Chinese cuisine to make the Duck House a hot spot for famous actors, politicians, and even presidents, all of whom credited the signature Peking duck as the best they'd ever tasted. Mr. Han leaves a legacy of two children, John and Jim, and the first of many grandchildren, Annie. Every time Jimmy looked at his father's young grinning face, he would be reminded of this strange memorial, which proved that half-truths made for the blandest fiction. A lie that was newspaper sanctioned, what could be a more fitting tribute to his father? And why argue when the lie of his father's life was no different, really, from the eulogy his mother had told at his father's funeral before she'd vanished inside the mansion he'd left to her? No different from the speeches that Johnny made at charity events and thousand dollars of plate fundraisers. No different from the story Jimmy himself used to pick up women before last call. Tonight, however, Jimmy was the only one telling the story and the only one listening. Bobby Hahn died, stomach bloated with cancer, with only his wife at his side. His two sons stayed behind at the restaurant, as instructed, to take advantage of the holiday crowd. Han was unlikely to have been born anywhere near China's capital city, since his mother, during her one visit to America, spoke with an accent so incomprehensible that Han's wife had called it dirt, her word for country. Said wife Feng Fei was 10 years younger than her husband, who, if their screaming matches could be believed, tried to abandon his family as soon as his tipi touched American soil. And it was not Han, but rather his best friend, Uncle Pong, who secured visas and later green cards for Feng Fei and the children, incurring a debt they would never fully repay. Before the Beijing Duck House could open its doors, a fortunate lightning storm had to strike Han's first restaurant, King China, and burn the shithole to the ground, allowing him to flip the insurance into a down payment for an abandoned building right off the highway. Han was hardly reinventing the wheel with his menu. Northern Chinese cuisine could be summed up in three words, meat, onions, garlic. And hot spot for the famous, Jimmy had had five years to laugh at the foolishness of that particular line. So fuck his father's legacy. Fuck his mother's too. Jimmy's new restaurant would not have such cheap illusions or clumsy broken booths or incompetent waiters. His new restaurant would be as polished as the silver chopsticks he'd already bulk ordered. The decor would be tasteful but luxurious. His menu would actually change. Every week, a new special, a catch of the day. None of the waiters would speak with an accent and his customers would be afraid of displeasing him. Hello? Jimmy stopped revising his father's life story at the sound of Janine's soft voice. So many questions, but I will start with the idea, I suppose. You said at an event that when writers are asked for the moment that they had the idea for their novel, what they're really being asked for is their origin story. And I'll leave that bit there so listeners can go and watch the video of the event. I'll put it in the description. You've a few origin stories. I won't ask for them all. Instead, I'll ask, is there one that's the most important to you to tell, the one that's most crucial to the book? Yeah, uh, that's such a great question, because I think it gets at the root of why we tell stories and why we retell stories, uh, which is often because there are moments that we can't really get out of our heads or that we feel to be transformative in hindsight. And so the story that I find the most important to tell, it's really the part of that origin story. And to give kind of brief context, I happened to work in a Chinese restaurant similar to one that's in my book for less than a month, the summer before I went to graduate school uh, which is where I wrote this novel. And the experience of working in that restaurant was very difficult, to say the least, both physically, but especially mentally and emotionally. There was just this alienated sense of serving customers 12 hours a day, six days a week, who just didn't really see me as a full human being. And I think this is fairly universal for all restaurant and service people, but there was an extra dose of that because I happened to have a Chinese face and be working in a Chinese restaurant. And, you know, this was something that became clear because with some customers, when they would hear my voice and they would hear a voice they weren't expecting, one with an American accent, you know, there'd be almost a clearing of the eyes. So that was a part that I always felt was important to tell because 
while there is that universal sense of all service people being treated as less than the people they are working for in that moment, there is that doubled alienation somehow that came attributed to working in a restaurant that would be described as ethnic and having a face that would be described as foreign. And the other part that I always felt was really important to my origin story was the kind of wrongheadedness that my uh, anger first took. Because after I quit the restaurant, I was embarrassed to not have lasted for very long, assumed that I was made of tougher stuff. And then in the process of thinking about the emotional pain of what I went through, kind of overcorrected. And suddenly I couldn't believe how anybody could last for longer than I had. Really just thought of myself as made of such tough stuff to have lasted for even four weeks. And I'm very glad that my past self continued to reflect and think about why this new story wasn't clicking. Because the truth was all of my coworkers had been in that environment for longer than four weeks. And many of them had actually been with the restaurant since it opened 30 years ago. And so I had to ask myself then, what was their experience like that was missing from mine? And what became clear was that they had these relationships with each other, these incredibly rich and at times dysfunctional relationships in a way that reminded me of family. And that was where they got the recognition and the respect and the love and the, the fighting and the human drama, all the parts that make for a full human life. And they had created it inside of a restaurant because they couldn't access it in the outside world because of the hours that they worked. So that part is so key for me as well in the story because I think that it was that realization and I don't know when I had it, and I don't know if I had it in one epiphanous moment or if it was over the course of writing the first draft of this novel, but at some point those pieces clicked into place and I understood that this wasn't gonna be some story of revenge of some outsider who comes in and works at this restaurant and calls out all its BS. It was gonna be about the people who had been there long before I showed up and how they had made a life for themselves for better or for worse. Wow, yeah, that, that is a, an awesome answer. I've got so many questions from there. <laughs> I know you've just said about the book not being at all about an outsider who comes in and sees all the stuff. But mm -hmm. if it's okay, could I ask, you said that you had a Chinese face in a Chinese restaurant added an extra level of alienation. I am copying that quote from an article that I will link to. And you've mm -hmm. just talked about this for us. Seeing how you were treated what was the difference like with the customers and the other waiters? Yeah, I think that what I started to see was just kind of the feeling that it wasn't necessarily a purposeful alienation or even an active one. And in some ways, if I hadn't experienced the other end of it with certain customers, I wouldn't have been able to clock it, you know, if I had been a customer at that restaurant. Hmm. But I think that there is first the sense that they're not exactly talking to another person. They're maybe talking to someone who is kind of a middleman to the meal they eventually will have. And that quality of conversation, well, I mean, it's not a conversation. It's really somebody giving orders to the kind of air around them. There's not a sense that there is another person at the other end. But the other quality and here's maybe where the double alienation comes in is there's this assumption that because the people who uh, worked at this restaurant are immigrants, that they won't be able to understand what the customers are saying about them. And so there's just these side conversations that would happen about their waiters, about the food, about what was happening, that it was just this assumption that the person that was standing couple of inches away from them would not be able to understand or hear or have a reaction to what was being said. In some ways, it felt like over the course of those four weeks, a kind of slow encroaching invisibility because it wasn't active. It wasn't somebody looking you in the eye and saying something pejorative. It was just slowly erasing you from being a part of the customer's world, which I think is why then such a rich behind the scenes world made sense because you weren't going to be able to get any of those interactions from the people that you were 
seeing at the front of the house. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. When reading your book, I'm noticing that you've got the customers and understandably they don't get much of a look in because they're in the backdrop, which was obviously an interesting reversal of how you would expect things to be. You know, in reality, we think about hospitality and the people who are the customers. But at the same time, they're crucial to the book, which is interesting in itself again. So I suppose we kind of get this idea from what you're talking about now, what you're wanting the readers to see in these customers and their inclusion. Yeah, that's such a great point. And I love that you've made it. And this is kind of the wonderful and terrifying thing about writing is that I never set forth thinking, well, I'm going to erase the customer. They're not going to be important. They're going to be in the backdrop now. It ended up that way in part because there is a additional persecution that I bring in as the outsider. You know, how dare they erase me? And that in some ways centers the customer in my experience, right? That there's this relationship that we have in which I have a grievance, however real and valid it might be. Whereas with my coworkers and what I understood was that in the same way that the customers didn't really care about them, they didn't really care or think that much about the customers. Maybe it was something, you know, a callus that built up over time, or maybe it was never that big of an issue. In trying to capture that real experience of where the real life, the real drama and interest and attention and energy is all happening behind the scenes, not actually relatively speaking, what's happening, serving the rote meals of the front of the house, that I think inadvertently, unconsciously made it so that the customers were erased. Because I think in capturing what I hope to be a realistic experience of working behind the scenes at a Chinese restaurant, that you don't really think about the customer outside of, okay, right now I need to deliver this orange chicken. But I'm going to go back now and scream at the cook because how dare he say that about my brother, you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. One of the most compelling aspects, moving on a little bit, in the book is how you use race further than what we've been discussing. You touch on so many things and you kind of delve into things without delving into them, I suppose you could say. Mm -hmm. How did you come to decide how to discuss the issues you do in this context, if that makes sense? Yeah, I think that definitely makes sense. And I think in some ways, my answer is twofold. And the first part is I grew up in a place that I later realized once I left was actually very heavily Asian American and Chinese American. And when I looked up the statistics later, I was kind of shocked, but then it actually fit with my lived experience, which was that in the neighborhood where I grew up, Gaithersburg, Maryland, I believe one in four people is Asian American which is shocking when you consider that I think in all of America, it's like in the single digit percentage points of how many Asian Americans there are. And so I just grew up in a place where it was almost the norm, almost as normal as was to be white in America, to be Chinese in Gaithersburg. And so my understanding of race was growing up in my most formative years, one in which I didn't really engage with it in a visceral sense. It was more, I understood that technically I was a minority, there aren't that many of me, and I'm not part of the mainstream uh, culture, but going to school every day, the friends that I made, the people that I was around, the number of Chinese restaurants that I had at my disposal, they all told me a different story. So I think that's why in some ways the handling of race or the interest in race is not the focal point because that wasn't the focal point of me growing up in this neighborhood. And I think on the other side, as I was thinking about this book while writing it, I really started to question why the Chinese restaurant had its place in American culture the way it is, which is to say that it's pretty much ubiquitous. And I looked up the numbers and it turns out that there are drastically more Chinese restaurants than McDonald's. I think there are more than McDonald's, Burger King, KFC, Taco Bell's combined. It's like an incredible statistic. And yet for something that is so ubiquitous that you might as well say there's almost nothing as American as a Chinese restaurant, it also occupies this place where it's often made fun of. There's a lot of jokes about Chinese food, how you're always hungry after you eat it, which by the way is because you're not eating it right. You're supposed to eat it with rice. <laughs> rice is what fills you up. And just this general sense that you could have an Italian restaurant that was a Michelin star or Italian-American restaurant that was both high and low. 
and you could have that with so many different other cultures. But when it came to the Chinese and Chinese American restaurant, it was always put into a weird, solely low corner, always something to make fun of. And so I think that because food is so much of a vehicle for other discussion points like race and culture and gender as well, that by writing a book about food and feeding people and a Chinese restaurant, I couldn't also not be about race. And so I think that was a interesting thing that I saw in hindsight, which is that I did find in some ways a perfect vehicle to talk about race without talking about it, because just mentioning a Chinese restaurant, you automatically make the assumption that you are talking about race while never having to name anybody's race because the default at a Chinese restaurant is that everybody is Chinese who works there. So I really lucked out in that sense. I wanted to ask, in context and slightly out of it again, where you've been talking about race and also the amount of restaurants, does the title have a place in there at all? Yeah. Again, I love this question. You have some really... Yeah, I just am really loving how you've been reading this book because I think that the title was something that I was interested in when I was first telling people what my book was called. It would become not exactly a social experiment, but a kind of barometer because I started to notice that when I would say, oh, my book's called Number One Chinese Restaurant, the reaction would almost be like a little giggle, like a little laughter because there was something inherently comical about both the idea of a number one Chinese restaurant, but also like the actual fact that a lot of terrible Chinese takeout joints call themselves number one Chinese restaurant. I took the name from this takeout Chinese restaurant that my family used to eat at when we would go to Ocean City, Maryland. And my dad loved the place because it actually did make really delicious, if bad for you, Chinese American food. And so I think that within that name already, the listener's reaction to it, the sense that you want to laugh at it, you think it's a joke, gets at, I think, one of the crucial themes that I was interested in exploring of why are Chinese restaurants in America automatically a joke? And at the same time, what would it mean for somebody in this book to want to both take the Chinese restaurant out of that joking territory, but in doing so also take himself out of that joking territory to gain respect as a person and a human being through the vehicle of having a Chinese restaurant that nobody can laugh at. Interesting, interesting. I know when I started reading the book, I thought, oh, okay, number one Chinese restaurant, maybe that's the restaurant name. And then you carry on in the dark house and you think, oh, okay, all right, well, carry on and find out. And of course, then it does hit you at a certain point. It is a very interesting point you're making about it, I think, that, yes, it can be humorous, but also there's just so much more to it. I'm glad that your answer was so layered almost. Could we have the second reading? Yeah, absolutely. So just a quick setup for this part of the reading. It's, It's basically a flashback into Jimmy's life. He's, I think, 40 in the present time. And so this is him when he's just 19. The first two decades of Jimmy's life, he believed cooks didn't talk in the kitchen. Waiters could shout, dishwashers could flirt with the duck carvers, but the cooks stood silent over their walks. They were like the old horses Jimmy had once seen on a duck farm in Long Island with their sloped backs and long motionless faces. They looked too miserable for words. He was a few months shy of 20 when he walked into Coy's pristine lobby on the first day of his stage. He passed the indoor waterfall and rock garden through the restaurant's sunlit dining room. He assumed he was about to enter an equally soundless kitchen. The chef, a white man named Alfred, led the way. I don't usually let people stage who haven't worked in a kitchen before. The chef glanced down at the overpacked knife kit in Jimmy's hands. How many resumes did you fax me again? A lot, Jimmy said. Chef, he added, 60 resumes and not a single one with relevant work experience. Chef Alfred knocked back a double shot of espresso. But you have passion. That's something you can't teach, he thought for a moment. You can use a knife, though, yes? Jimmy nodded. He'd been practicing on crates of onions filched from the duck house, and he'd gone through so many that the amount of missing produce was driving his father crazy. 
Jimmy's father had no idea who to blame. And when he wasn't on the phone with the produce supplier, he was interrogating every person on staff from the prep cooks to the little girl who poured water on the weekends. Served him right, the asshole. If Bobby hadn't thrown him out of the duck house for wanting to apprentice at Koi, Jimmy could have afforded to buy his own practice onions. The tips he'd saved had run out with his rent check and stages didn't pay. He felt too young for the knives he was holding. He was 19 and had never been broke in his life. There's knife skills we can teach, the chef was saying, but we'd rather not. Thank you for this opportunity, Jimmy said. They approached the kitchen doors and excitement replaced his dread. Two months ago, after his mother insisted they go for her birthday, he'd eaten here for the first time. His world had split open as neatly as an apricot. His father had not enjoyed the meal. Chef Alfred put his hand on the kitchen door and pushed his way in. You're free labor, he said, before the sound of pans crashing together swallowed his words. The noise was sudden and explosive. Jimmy didn't realize that most of it was coming from a stereo in the back. Shut that fucking death metal off, Ronnie, Chef Alfred yelled, his pale face growing mottled as he battled the volume of the music. The kitchen was full of stout men with sleek tattoos and wild, unfocused looks in their eyes, but to Jimmy's surprise, Ronnie turned out to look not unlike himself. Strolling to the stereo, Ronnie turned the volume dial a scooch to the left, looking at the chef with what Jimmy's father would have called a smack me face. That's our fish cook, Ronnie, Chef Alfred said. I don't know why I haven't cut him yet, but you'll be helping out at his station. Chef, I got that eel. Ronnie came up to them with a plated tureen of unagi over toasted rice. The smell of murin, sake, and sesame oil, the holy trinity of fragrance, hit Jimmy's nose. His stomach grumbled loud enough for both men to hear. He'd been living off onion sandwiches for a week. Little dude is hungry, Ronnie clapped Jimmy on the shoulder. Chef Alfred carved a spoon through the tower and chewed. He began to hum softly. A dreamy look settled over his face and he leaned against a steel prep table. That's it. He sucked the sauce off his teeth. That's why you're still here. Butchered it myself, Ronnie said. Then he turned to Jimmy. Want a taste? Jimmy grabbed the chef's spoon and shoved half the tureen into his mouth before he realized his mistake. The two men looked at him with shocked faces. Shit, that was for the rest of the kitchen, Ronnie said, looking at the plate. We taste in the kitchen. We don't eat. Chef Alfred said. Jimmy knew he should be embarrassed, but the eel was buttery and sweet in his mouth, flaking against his tongue like snow, and the toasted rice cut through the softness with a nutty crunch, his stomach filled with warmth. He reached out for the plate again before Ronnie could pull it away and plucked a crisp half moon of cucumber to clear the unagi sauce off his tongue. That was amazing, he said, picking a sesame seed out of his teeth like one of the best things I've eaten in my entire life. Can you teach me how to make it? Where the fuck did you find this kid? Ronnie asked. He just hoovered my dish. With that, Ronnie brought Jimmy around the kitchen, introducing him to the other cooks and kitchen staff. Jimmy quickly learned that Ronnie was the unofficial ambassador of the Koi crew, untethered by kitchen hierarchy. He not only knew everybody, prep cooks, line cooks, and pastry chefs alike, but had recently partied with, schemed with, or owed money to each person who shook Jimmy's hand. He reminded Jimmy of a cruder, cooler version of his own brother. Ronnie finished the tour with the dishwashers, a trio of Hondurans who looked at the empty plate in Jimmy's hands with open disgust. They usually get a taste after the rest of the kitchen, Ronnie whispered, bringing Jimmy back to his station. Look, we'll get you back into everyone's good graces. He reached under his prep table and pulled out a big blue bucket. Something was thunking against the plastic. Jimmy looked down to see a swirl of freshwater eels, their gray and white bodies thick and tangled in the low water. You ever butcher an eel before? Ronnie put on a blood-spotted fillet glove. He stuck his hand in the bucket and pulled out a wriggling eel by the head, its thin muscular body almost the length of Jimmy's arm. I made this contraption myself. He pointed to the wet board on his table, a screwdriver sticking out of the wood. How do you butcher an eel? Jimmy asked. A strange, floating sensation clouded his head. He realized his hands were sweating. Easy, Ronnie said. In one fluid motion, he slammed the eel onto the board and stuck the screwdriver through its head. He hammered the driver down with the flat of his knife, then stuck the blade below the gills, running it down the length of the eel until he butterflied it in half. 
Jimmy started breathing hard through his nose, black spots dancing in his vision. Ronnie spread the eel open like a book. And as he was dragging the knife back down, peeling the translucent white flesh off the skin, Jimmy felt his eyes roll up in his head. With a strangled curse, he went down hard. And that's where I'll stop there. Is Jimmy your favorite character? (laughs) Again, I love these questions. I would say that Jimmy is my favorite character. And in some ways, that's why, especially in early drafts, I would do him a disservice in the sense that I effectively spoiled him. I let him have all his temper tantrums. I let him be terrible to his staff, terrible to his family. And I just assumed in the same way that I guess maybe a parent would for a child that they're spoiling, that everybody would love him as much as I did. And it actually took my editor forcing me to write this chapter that I just read from, that I understood that while I had lived with Jimmy for about three years, readers were meeting him for the very first time, and he was making a really terrible first impression. That's interesting that your editor said that, because until I got to that chapter... I was thinking your favourite character was Pat. Oh, very interesting. Why was that? Um, that's a good question. I think just the way that you built him up, the way that you added his story into it and how he was and the relative freedom within the context of the novel that he had at that moment that I thought maybe he was, which is quite vague, I know. (laughs) No, no, not at all. I think that that makes a lot of sense. And I would say, oh, it's hard because in some ways... Everyone is a favorite in different ways. And I would say that Pat's relationship with his mother, Nan, was probably my favorite, most emotional relationship. I had the most emotional attachment to their relationship and getting it right. And so I think that makes sense that that kind of attention made Pat seem like also a potential favorite. But I would say that Jimmy was the one who started this entire book. And maybe because I'm a kind of placid person, his anger and volatility were so fun for me to tap into that I I think I just ran away with it. (laughs) Wonderful. You (laughs) mentioned Nan and Pat's relationship. Why was that important to the book for you? So I'll give basically like the more in the head reason and then I'll give my in the heart reason. But in the head reason, it was because I was really interested in how so many story is really the main story that was being told about immigrant parents and their American children was one of total kind of love, sacrifice, doing everything for the child to make sure the child was happy, or at the very least had like a stable roof over their heads. And I was so interested in this idea that Nan could be a mother who, yes, was working herself so hard to create that kind of stable household for her son and as a single mother, but at the same time that her interest in work wasn't entirely 100% devoted to her son. That didn't feel real to me. It didn't feel in some ways fair to all the working immigrant parents that I knew, that I grew up with, who also worked for their own ambition, their own sense of fulfillment, their own relationship to the people they worked with. And sometimes that was more interesting or more fulfilling than coming home to a kid that is starting to have some behavioral issues. And I just really wanted to capture that other side of the hardworking immigrant parent narrative. That I wanted to show that no person can be that 100% of a martyr. So it was very meaningful for me to be able to show that Nan could be flawed and human in the way that she isn't making choices that benefit her son and that she is oftentimes choosing her work over her son, but that I wanted it to be so that you would understand why, why she was making those choices and that it didn't make her a bad mother. It just meant that she was making decisions that sometimes suited herself better. And the results were that they hurt the relationship that she had with her son. And my in the heart reason is that you know, it's meaningful for me to see and capture the ways in which parents and children miss each other and misunderstand each other and hurt each other. And I wanted to be able to show that even with a history of baggage and emotional pain, that there's always with enough time and effort a way through. 
And so I really wanted to show that even though the relationship that Nan has with her son, Pat, is difficult and full of hurt on both sides, that as long as there was a foundation of love and there was the fortune of having enough time on your side that they could find each other and that there was always the chance that they could be able to see each other clearly, even if there had been years and years and years of missing each other. Well, I liked how it starts out as a nice relationship anyway, but it really blossoms throughout. And the way that towards the end, as things happen and and you kind of get towards where you might have thought it might have happened earlier with Pat, when uh, revelations come to the fore and things like that, and the choices she makes and the choices the rest of them make as well, but particularly Nan, I thought was lovely. I have to give my editor props again, because in some ways... Nan's actions at the end were more muted when I first wrote it because I'm not a parent myself and it took my editor who is a parent to say that oh you need to amp Nan's actions up because she is going to behave in a more extreme and intense way as a parent for her son than you currently have it and I thought this is why you have other people read your work because they're going to bring attention to those blind spots. Ah, fab. Well, I've got a question that's quite different, but the aspect of the book towards the end that sticks in my mind is Pat's choice to use Chinese when he replies to his mother. There's a lot of language switching in the book. You've got Chinese to English, English to Chinese, and particularly within the same conversations back and forth, uh, you've got descriptions of why in the moment that's happening. Why did you decide to do this whole thing and your choices in terms of grammar and words? uh, What were they informed by? Yeah, I thought a lot about language, especially at the beginning of the book, because it had been something that had preoccupied me since I'd started writing, which was how to accurately represent what it feels like for me as someone who is fluent in both, although much worse at Chinese and what it's like for me to talk to my parents and our switching back and forth. And so I thought it was important to write from that perspective. You know, I think just given the numbers, I knew that most of my readers were not going to be Chinese or would not understand Chinese, but that in order to stay true to the characters and my perspective, I wouldn't be putting anything in Chinese into the actual Chinese and then translating it because that's not the actual experience when you already know the language. Basically, when I hear my parents speak, the only way that I initially clock that they are speaking English instead of Chinese is that there is just a different vibe. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Like they are slightly different people in English. Maybe there's a little bit more effort too at times, or they're just choosing different words than they otherwise would in Chinese. But that's what I noticed, not that the words have changed, but that their mood has changed. And so, for example, You know, I'll note that Nan switches to Chinese because it's the better language to scold in. And so when I do mark the language changes, I want to show that it's because the tone has shifted and that's why the character is changing. And that's also what the character who is listening is reacting to. So that was a lot of what I was thinking about language wise, making it as seamless as possible. And in an initial drafts, I never marked the language change, but it actually created the very issue I was trying to avoid, that by not naming any of the language changes, it was confusing people and they would pay more attention to whether or not the language had changed, which was the very thing I was trying to prevent. (laughs) Yeah, I just think it worked very well. And yeah, I mean, you're able to bypass some of the issues that can happen Mm -hmm. when people use different languages and then they translate and things, as you say. Completely different character now and completely different kind of question, but Could the story have been told without Uncle Pung? (laughs) Again, such a good question. I'm going to say that probably after every question that you ask, because in some ways, I think Uncle Pung was a character that I struggled with, but he did feel so necessary to this book because in some ways, even though I was really interested in the characters, this world, uh, what happens when the restaurant that everybody has been contained in disappears and they have to rebuild their lives. I also needed a plot (laughs) and Uncle Pong became my plot. His almost devil-like ability, godfather-like ability to mess things up for people, 
to go through underhanded ways in order to make that restaurant disappear, put people into corners, expose secrets. He was the person who made things happen. And so even though he is probably the character that I explore the least, although I think there is a moment between him and Feng Fei where you do get a sense of hopefully why Uncle Pong is behaving the way he does, that if not for him, this would mostly just be a book about people in the restaurant living their normal lives. I suppose you could say he's kind of a stereotype for good reason. Yes. And that's also the wonderful thing about writing a book in which everybody is Chinese is that you get to have a stereotype because you have 15 other examples of non-stereotypes. Oh, I know when I was starting the book and we got to the uncle and stuff and I'm thinking, oh, this is going to be a thriller book then, you know, so it was quite <laughs> quite a surprise, but I liked it. I liked it a lot. <laughs> was it always your intent to include moments of comedy? Yeah, I think so. I think because the nature of like working in a high stress environment kind of like necessitates humor and like oftentimes it's like gallows humor. But I think also I love making people laugh. I like laughing or like seeking out situations that make me laugh. Because it's weird to say I like to laugh because everybody enjoys laughing. (laughs) So I think just naturally, even though I would say that the voice of this novel isn't particularly stylized, I don't know if it necessarily sounds like me. I think that its humorous touches are maybe the ways in which I'm revealing my voice. Mm -hmm, mm Mm-hmm. I've left this question to the last bit, I suppose, showing what I took away from the book myself. But what is the importance of food for you further than its simple inclusion, so to speak, in the book? I think definitely one could say that food is its own character in this book, which is a slightly corny way of putting it, but it is also the simplest way of putting it. And I think that actually the issue that I had with earlier drafts of this book was that food represented so much that I actually wasn't putting actual food into the book. That for a book that was about food and concerned about how food was a way of representing your culture, it was also a way that one's culture can be denigrated or judged or stereotyped, that it was a way for family members to communicate to each other, that so much of Chinese culture is around food to the point where instead of asking how are you? The analogous greeting is, have you eaten yet? And the fact that food was all of these different themes and metaphors meant that actually I didn't really describe food very much. And a lot of times when I would describe the food, especially at the Beijing Duck House, I would you know, mention that it was greasy or that it was oversalted or that it looked a certain way and, and it was very untasty. And again, I consistently cite my editor because she's the best, Barbara Jones, because at one point she pulled me aside and she said, okay, I understand. Yes, this kind of takeout food can be greasy, but I have to ask you, do you enjoy it? Do you like eating it? And I was like, oh yeah, I love it. Love Panda Express. I love General Tso's, all of it. And she's like, yes, okay, I'd like to see that because it can be both. And so through her pushing, that was actually when I realized that I can describe food as a metaphor as much as I want. I can explore it in all those ways, but maybe some of the best ways to examine those metaphors is to just have food be itself and create that kind of visceral experience. Like for the example from where I read, describing that unagi dish, you know, I'm going into all of the sensual flavors and smells and textures that are there And I think in doing so, it makes the point better about what kind of restaurant this is, what kind of class this restaurant is in, what customers come to this restaurant, what kind of knowledge and idea of Pan-Asian food they have. And Jimmy's enjoyment of it is loaded because it's also putting this kind of food on a pedestal when he technically has worked in a restaurant that has served in its way authentic Chinese food or Chinese American food for years. And I could have said all of that, but instead, if I just describe the dish as it actually would be, it makes the point, I think, better. No, yeah, I I agree. I did like how you used it in that way. When you're reading about the glory, the restaurant that's going to come after the duck house, and Jimmy's talking about his food, or you're talking about it, third person narrative, he's thinking about it. 
Was Jimmy's original menu for the glory, as opposed to the duck house, would you have said that was decent food? Oh. <laughs> you know, I know no one seemed to like it, but would it have been good? Yeah, such a good question. I think that in some ways, because it would have been an imitation of this restaurant that he idolized as a 19 year old, it could not have been because it would have been trying so hard because that's who he was at 19, that's who he is still. And I think that that food actually would not have given him pleasure outside of what it stood for. Mm. So I think all of those weird ideas he has and the descriptions of people not really enjoying it come from the fact that Jimmy himself would have enjoyed the food. I think he would have just been impressed by it. Very interesting to know, yeah. So coming to the end here, what's next? Yeah, so I've been working on a second novel that is basically a a group of childhood friends from also Gaithersburg, Maryland, who have graduated into the recession. It's 2009, so they have all been forced to move back into their parents' houses. And this is such a deviation from their plans because they have grown up their entire lives as very competitive and academically overachieving Chinese American kids. And so in this place of new kind of disappointment in themselves, reflection for the first time on what they were even striving for, that's when a girl that they grew up with comes back into their lives, a girl who in some ways represented this golden standard of the perfect student, the perfect Chinese child comes back with a proposition that they participate in a documentary with her about this interruption in their lives. And it kind of spools out from there. But I think this is probably the most specific I've ever gotten about the description of the book, probably because in past times when people have asked, I had not yet figured out what the book was about. So I'm excited about where it's going. And I've always loved writing ensembles and having a lot of characters and especially characters who have known each other for a really long time. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, I know I'm sitting here listening to you and I think, yep, yep, this sounds good. And then you say about the documentary, I'm like, ooh, ooh, okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, that sounds really, really good. Is Barbara going to be editing it? Yeah, I mean, I would love if Barbara would be editing it. And I think that in my ideal situation, she would be. I love that you had that reaction to the documentary because in some ways this documentary does feel like the Uncle Pong of this book. <laughs> <laughs> like it's the plot. <laughs> Can't write the same book twice, but you can write something that's got similar aspects to yes, it, definitely. Exactly. A template. <laughs> Do we have any sort of rough date or idea of when this might be uh, published? No, no date yet. I'm still trucking along, getting it into a shape where people besides me and my agent get to see it but fingers crossed that I continue to work at the pace that I am because it has been a lot of fits and starts an interesting part of finishing a book at least for me was realizing that I actually needed to take time to not write in order to have the creativity and the interest to tackle another big project so I'm just so thrilled to be writing regularly right now because there was about two or three years of kind of nothing. So I'm just happy to be writing. Good. Now you you needed that break, obviously. Yeah. In retrospect, now I can say that. At the time, I did not feel like that. Not an author, but I can expect it would, yeah. Yeah. So I'm hoping that if there are any of your listeners who are creating creative output, that they understand that there's like, periods of you're just making stuff that you're not proud of and that is just as necessary definitely definitely links to purchase number one chinese restaurant are in the episode description along with my email address if you have enjoyed our conversation do subscribe or follow for future episodes lillian i've very much enjoyed getting to know your characters in the short narrative time frame that was quite a highlight i like that in itself and it's been absolutely wonderful having you on hearing all the nitty gritty and lots of things that I actually didn't even think about and things that you've opened up further for me and hopefully also the listeners to think about. So thank you so much for being with me today. No, thank you, Charlie. I mean, your questions were fantastic. You can hear how much I love them. And you've, you know, allowed me to think even deeper about this book, which is always really meaningful to me. So thank you for having me on and letting me 
dip back into these characters because it's, it's been a while since I've revisited them. The next episode will be on Monday the 12th of April. The Wormhole Podcast, episode 34, was recorded on the 12th of March and published on the 22nd of March, 2021. Music and production by Charlie Place.